The modern Bible versions are clearly different than the King James Bible. And you've got to ask yourself this question, why? In order to understand the difference, you need to understand the history of the English Bible. Turns out there's a Bible museum right here in Phoenix that has one of the largest collections of rare English Bibles in the world. And the museum director, Joel Lamp, is going to let us actually look into these rare first editions of the Bibles leading up to the King James and the King James itself. He's going to explain to us the history of our King James Bible. He's going to take us all the way from Erasmus Greek New Testament, the original Texas Receptus, and he's going to take us through the history of all these English Bibles all the way up to the King James Version. So let's start with Erasmus. What you see here on the table, Pastor, is in a nutshell the history of the King James Bible. Now remember, the King James Bible was printed in 1611, and there's a common misconception out there that it was the first English. Well, it wasn't. There were numerous other English examples before right. the 1611. Uh -huh. And what you see here starts with the original Greek, as you just said, Textus Receptus, done by Erasmus of Rotterdam. This literally changed everything from what we know today in church history as well as in just secular history. It's called the 1516 Erasmus of Rotterdam's Greek, Latin, New Testament. Well, let's just call Erasmus what he is, the okay. smartest man that ever lived, okay? Non-deity factor, okay? Jesus, of course, is the <laughs> smartest man that ever lived. But Solomon's up there as well. But even today, we consider Erasmus the smartest, whether it's in sciences, theology, philosophy. He was just that smart. And this is the original Textus Receptus original, right here. The original Textus Receptus. Wow. Please take a look at it generally considered the most important book that was ever printed. And this is the book that launches the Reformation. Even as an atheist, you acknowledge this is the most important book ever printed. The Renaissance is launched from this. The truth comes from this book. And so we see just how imperative this book is. But what it also did was cause an enormity of problems. And what do I mean by that? Well, the money stopped flowing to Rome. There's a building under construction. There's a very famous interior designer down there that was hired to decorate it. Of course, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the Vatican. Michelangelo, the Sistine Chapel, that money stopped flowing, the church started putting bounties on people's heads, saying, you can't teach this. This isn't what we consider accurate, even though Erasmus said, we kind of got a problem here. It does say, metanoia, not pay a fine. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to address this theological issue, but the Protestant movement was birthed from this book. And what does the Protestant movement actually mean? To protest. In this edition that you're showing me, Erasmus has put the original Greek mm -hmm. next to the church's Latin. That's correct. And it makes it very easy to see the contradiction between the two. Of course. Is that right? That's why okay. it's, that's Just why making it, sure I understand. That's why it changed everything. Because it showed what we were doing wrong, showed what it should be. Right. But he didn't translate it to show what it should be until later. Okay. Okay, that wouldn't be until right. 1519. So th these are two contradictory things side by side. And all he's doing is just showing the evidence. The church's Latin corrupted version, uh -huh. and then the original Greek Texas Receptus. Right. He just put it side by side and just basically let the reader be the judge. But this is the bullet that basically effectively killed the church. Right. What you see here is what we know today as the first edition Coverdale Bible. What really it is, though, is the work of William Tyndale. Now, as we know, Tyndale is the inventor of the English we speak today. He's also the inventor of our very first English Bible translated from the original languages. Tyndale in England wanted to do the same thing Luther was doing in Germany. Mm -hmm. And he went underground, and with the aid of Luther's library, books like this here, and later editions of Erasmus's work, Tyndale would produce the very first New Testament. It becomes the most hunted book in the history of England. And so the king wants this thing burned. So England was still totally under the control of the Catholic Church at the time that Tyndale is producing his New Testament 1526. And it is a book that's basically an assault mm -hmm. on the established or Catholic Church of London right. at that time. This became a monumental achievement because Tyndale, in the last years of his life, spent most of his time translating from the Hebrew and the Greek to produce this book. The rest of the Old Testament, some of it, they weren't able to get done from the original Hebrew by the time this book came out? Well, no, because Tyndale was arrested in 1534. Right. He's held under house arrest for 500 days. Okay. And then on the morning of October 6, 1536, he's taken out and burned. But in that incarceration period, Miles Coverdale mm -hmm. finished that which Tyndale had started. Gotcha. Now, what I love more than anything that we have in this room 
is this text here. This is the 1537, what we call the Matthews Bible. Now, what is this? It's nothing more than it completed this. Right. Now, remember, when Tyndale dies, his last words, as you spoke so eloquently earlier, were, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. Now, what happened in that prayer? Tyndale could have said a million things. Why waste your last breath saying, Lord, open the eyes of King of England? Tyndale knew that no matter how crazy Henry VIII was, that if he could get Henry VIII to break with the established Church of Rome, England would be won and protected. It's one thing to have a personal relationship with Jesus. It's another thing to have a personal relationship with Jesus with somebody wanting to wake up and kill you every morning. That, mm -hmm. was, that was their mission. But finally, Henry VIII permitted the Bible to go free based on one thing, a divorce. These two texts obviously change England. You, you could truly have a personal relationship with Jesus from these two books. Mm -hmm. You had that mediator of the You had to have someone. Instead of just Jesus Christ being the mediator. What we call today the confession booth. Right. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been two weeks since my last confession. So this defeated the confessional booth. It got rid of it completely. Mm -hmm. There was no need anymore. You didn't have to have a man tell you what your penalty was for this crime that you committed against mm -hmm. God. Then what we have today is called the Great Bible, or the Bible that was actually authorized and permitted by Henry VIII, King of England. That will become fun and to remember a couple of things. A later edition of Erasmus's work was done by a guy named Biza. And another work that we're most familiar with, though, is this one here done by Stephanus. Mm -hmm. Now, Stephanus is important because he gives us the Greek that our Geneva Bible, or the Bible done by the reformers of John Calvin, William Whittingham, those guys, they will use this Greek text to translate what their English Bible is known as today is the Geneva Bible. You know, it's famous because it's the first one with verses. Okay, and that's why the Geneva Bible is so you know, familiar to many of us. It's like, where did John 3.16 come from? Well, it came from they These divided guys, it into, into chapters verses, and, and verses. verses. Gotcha. The chapters were already there, chapters were already there. They but the verses, the verses are Gotcha. After Henry VIII, his son takes the throne. And we know him today as Edward VI. He died very young. He was only on the throne for four or five years. But in that time, he permitted the scriptures to go free as well. But he too had no spouse and no kids. And so when he doesn't have an heir, who ends up taking the throne? His sister, who we know today as Bloody Mary. And we don't call her that because she liked vodka, tomato juice with a splash of Tabasco. <laughs> we call her Bloody Mary because she was responsible for literally over 7,000 of her own people's death. Wow. And here's a perfect example. Here's a family pastor in Bloody Mary's reign. Here's mm -hmm. five mothers and five fathers all being burned at the stake. And for what reason? They taught their children the Lord's Prayer in English. Wow. And she had them burned at the stake. So in her zeal for the Catholic Church, she's, she's killing these people. The parents were teaching their kids. Okay, and they only wanted the church, church to teach, teach them. their kids. We weren't qualified, Pastor, to teach our children. So basically, they're being burned at the stake for homeschooling. That's basically what it <laughs> came down to. It. No, it's in, in yeah. a sense, it was. They wanted complete rule. Wow. Well, during that uprising, men of courage decided that we're going to rebel. Mm -hmm. And what were their names? John Knox, John Fox, William Whittingham. They fled England, and they go to work on a brand new text. And what do we call that text today? We call that the Geneva Bible. Well, it says right on there, it says someone has written here, Family Bible. That's right. That's what it truly was, the very first Family Bible. Right. What we know today is the Textus Receptus. It will go to produce what we know as the very first homeschool Bible, the Geneva Bible. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this is the book that sails over on the Mayflower. Gotcha. That's the Bible that settles Jamestown. Mm -hmm. After Bloody Mary's terror, she had a sister. We, of course, we know her name as Queen Elizabeth. To win the hearts of the people, she gave us the Bishop's Bible. This was done by bishops, mm -hmm. done by pastors. But they're building upon the work of... The Geneva Bible. They, they just wanted something that was a little bit more authoritative. Right. This comes from people you can experts. trust. Experts. Hebrew, Greek experts, but truthfully, right. it never settles with the people. It was a glorious work. 
she was somehow on, it just didn't catch on. It just never caught Maybe on. Maybe God just knew that something was better was coming down the pike. Yeah. And then, of course, she didn't have a spouse, no kids. So who would take the throne? Her cousin from Scotland, of course, we know him as King James. And that big, tall Bible that you see down there closest to you, that's the first edition of the King James Bible. And then a year later, he allowed the folks to buy one in a bookstore. And you're holding the very first King James New Testament. Wow. There. Then when we get to 1603, we have King James becoming king. King James VI of Scotland. He became the king, and it was said unto him that a new translation should be brought forth of the scriptures. And the reason why is that you got a lot of people using the Geneva Bible, but then they'd go to church and it's the Bishop's Bibles. There were two main versions, and both of them had issues. The Geneva Bible had some issues. The Bishop's Bible had some issues. And so they said, let's just take the time to do it right, they got the best scholars in the land together, and they said, we're not trying to replace a bad version. We're going from good to better to best here. I mean, these are good translations. The Geneva Bible is good. The Bishop's Bible is good. We're just going to perfect it and get it just dialed in. So from 1604 to 1610, the KJV was translated by 54 of the greatest scholars that existed at that time. Just to give you one example, one guy. Lancelot Andrews was an expert in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Chaldean, Syriac, Arabic, and he also spoke 15 modern languages. That's one guy out of the 54 people that translated the King James Bible over the course of seven years. So there were those who were Arabic scholars, there were those who were Greek and Hebrew scholars, there were Aramaic scholars. Uh, they were men of great intellect, mm -hmm. all of them. Yeah. And their knowledge of the scripture was varied they may have held some different beliefs or different areas of theology might be slightly different from one of the other translators. Mm -hmm. What they did was they divided themselves up into six groups. These six men translated these six books of the Bible and so forth. Mm -hmm. And when they did this, then they compared them all together. Mm -hmm. And each of the six groups did this. And then they chose one leader out of each group to evaluate all six groups. And they, so what happened was every passage of scripture was evaluated 15 times. Wow. And in the end of it all, all of them came into agreement mm -hmm. with what was translated based upon the correct verbal dynamic that they used. That is, for what it says, that's what it means, even if it was in slight contradiction to what they might think. The king in 1603 said, okay, I'm going to organize a committee. And no matter how long it takes, you're going to go to work using two rules. Old Testament must be translated from the Hebrew, New Testament must be translated from the Greek, and I'm going to give you all the resources humanly possible to make this happen. So the best Hebrew of that day, the best scholarly Greek of that day, and in 1603, 53 guys were hired. They go off, and for seven years, they work on what we know today is the most important book in the history of man, the first edition, first issue, first printing of the King James text. And it took them seven years, and they did a phenomenal job. And the King James that you and I read today, of course, comes from that 1769 right. revision. But this was the anchor of the text. And this is the product of it. And in 1612, he gives us what we know today as the very first handheld King James New Testament. And if this can, is what caught on. That's what caught on. The handheld King New says, Testament. if you can afford it, you can own it. Every bookstore in London sold it. <clears throat> and it would take off. And then it would become, and always has been, the number one selling book in the history of man. No book has ever outsold this text, or ever will.